OK, so you see the slides yeah. now, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I will start with the introduction, a short introduction sure. of our guest speaker today. Dr. Fazan Ali um, is assistant professor and graduate coordinator um, at University of South Florida, Sarasota Manatee Campus. And we are happy to have him as a guest speaker today because he has, uh, he had uh, like several, he's tracked to the PhD and to be professor at the University uh, was interesting in terms of life life experience and of course uh, his research interests are very close very relative to our school and of course uh, one more thing uh, Dr. Fizan has his own YouTube channel where he shares um, uh, the knowledge in papers publications so you can join his and subscribe uh, his uh, YouTube channel and today we're going to talk, as you see, about the publishing papers from failures to success. Thank you very much again that you kindly accept, accepted our invitation and the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hanna. Uh, it's a pleasure. You know, I actually um, have had uh, quite a lot of uh, friends from Ukraine, uh, very interestingly. So uh, I don't know where did my presentation go. Okay, I'm just going to bring it back. Uh, OK, so um, uh, in fact, one of my uh, very good uh, friend and now friend, but a couple of years ago, she was uh, my graduate student, uh, Olena. Uh, she is also from Ukraine, so I heard a lot from her ab uh, about Ukraine. In fact, when I shared the, about this session, she told me that uh, she would want to visit Sunny as well because she, even though she is from Ukraine, she has never been to Sunny. So um, I was very happy when I got to know that I'll be, uh, you know, talking to uh, researchers from all around, but especially from Ukraine. Uh, so I have some very good memories of Ukraine from my um, students. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the topic that we will talk about today is uh, publishing in SSCI journals or publishing in good journals, right? It's not always that uh, all the SSCI journals are good and vice versa. Uh, so we'll be talking about how do we publish on a good level, but then focus also on the problems and the mistakes that many people make uh, when they submit their papers to SSCI journals or to good journals and how to avoid those type of problems, right? So um, that's what we are going to be talking about today. So some of the stuff that we will be discussing today is uh, what is research? Why do we do this? Um, how do we come up with a good research idea? Uh, what makes a good research paper? What are some of the stuff that you need to think about when you are conducting research? Um, and then also understanding the publication process, right? So these are some um, of the stuff that we'll be talking about. Now, normally I want the sessions to be as interactive as possible. Um, it's too difficult for me to speak for hours. Uh, so if you have any questions or if you uh, don't agree or if you agree a lot to what I say, uh, then just uh, raise your hand. I think there's an option to raise your hands. Um, or unmute yourself and then we can talk about this more and more. OK, so um, we can start like that. I don't know if I can finish all the slides uh, because the time is what two hours, right, Professor Hanna? Uh, it's one hour and a half and maybe two hours. It depends okay. on so include on the question yeah, and answers, right? Yeah, it's OK. Let's all see right. how it no goes. Yeah. All right, so let's see how it goes. OK, so um, this is what we will be uh, discussing today. Now, a little bit about my background. So I uh, started working at University of South Florida in 2016 as an assistant professor. Uh, so it's already almost um, four and a half years um, uh, at USF. And believe me, I don't feel it's four and a half years. It, I, I feel like if I just started like last year or something, right? the time goes so quickly. Um, and um, before USF, I worked at Florida State University for a year as a postdoctoral scholar. <clears throat> so I did quite a bunch of research um, at Florida State University because uh, there was nothing else to do, no teaching, no other committees and anything, uh, but just research. So that was good. Uh, my PhD is from Malaysia. Um, I finished in 2015, um, my PhD. And then uh, prior to Malaysia, I was in UK for, a, I guess, three and a half years or so. Um, got my master's there. I worked there for a couple of years as well. 
Um, and I'm originally from Pakistan, so uh, my undergraduate degree, just like many other people, is from my own country. So I got an undergraduate degree in business administration and information technology. <clears throat> And then um, I've been quite active in research um, over the years. So by now, um, I've close to um, 110 uh, publications, including articles and uh, journal papers and uh, conference papers and stuff like this. <clears throat> my area of research is uh, hospitality and tourism consumer behavior. So I like my PhD is in marketing. So most of my research focuses on uh, consumer behavior in hospitality and tourism. Recently, I started working in services like not only hospitality and tourism, but broader services. Uh, but I also work in uh, advanced statistics and um, structural equation modeling and stuff like this. So that is a little bit about me. Now, like I said, today's session is mainly about my experiences uh, because I feel that uh, it's important that we learn from each other, right? So. Uh, instead of telling you a lot of bookish stuff, I feel it would be much more um, interesting if I share my experiences with you, right? So anything that I talk today um, is uh, my experience as an author. Like I published all these papers, so obviously it contributes to my experience as an author. But then at the same time, I'm involved heavily with uh, several journals um, in my field um, in services marketing and hospitality and tourism as editor or assistant editor or associate editor. So then uh, what happens in this role is that um, I, I receive the papers. So when we the journals receive a paper, I get to see those papers and then I find the reviewers for those papers, right? And then when reviewers submit their review, then I get to read those reviews as well. So it also contributes to my experience, not only as an author, but also as an editor, um, looking at papers, looking at the mistakes people make, looking at the good stuff that people do. Um, but then also read the reviews that come for each paper, right? So all of that contributes. So today's presentation is sort of a summary of all that learning that I've had over the years within these roles um, that I hold. Okay. Um, I do a lot of fun stuff as well that keeps me productive. So remember for all the people here, uh, don't spend your life only in research. It's not a good idea because if you only focus too much on research, um, then what happens is that you probably are going to burn out. Um, yesterday, one of my friends, a very good friend, a very close friend, uh, Professor Leonardo from Brazil, <clears throat> I talked to him and he told me that um, he was uh, quite sick uh, in the last few days. He didn't want to do anything. He had no energy and he thought he has COVID, but he got his test, but he doesn't have COVID. And then turns out that he was burnt out because of working too much, right? So if you focus too much on your work, uh, uh, there's a high chance that you are going to burn out. And then that's much, much more dangerous for you, right? So make sure that you have a good balance of your work, but then also at the same time, uh, try to enjoy your life as well so that it's, it's a good balance. What I do for my... Um, enjoying my life. I, I mean, obviously, because of COVID, a lot of this stuff is uh, <laughs> destroyed. But before COVID, I used to do a lot of hiking, skydiving, um, and do a lot of fun stuff, you know, dive with manatees and uh, theme parks and stuff like this. I traveled a lot, uh, quite a lot. Uh, there's no travel for the last one and a half year, but, you know, good memories. Uh, and then um, I like eating, uh, trying food and stuff like this. Uh, enjoy cooking as well for some times. And I'm a huge fan of nature, so I like a lot of animals and plants and stuff like this. So just, just something that keeps a good balance in my life. So with research and all the stuff that I do with research, doing things like this keeps a good balance, you know, keep me productive with the stuff that I do. So make sure that you have some sort of hobbies um, in your life. Okay, and then uh, Professor Hanna talked about YouTube channels. So this is another thing that I do, which takes a lot of time um, because there's not a lot of help available at this moment, but I try to do it. And this is just so that uh, help is provided to many young researchers. Now I normally feel, oops, what happened? Somebody else share the screen. 
OK, so <laughs> all right, so I am going to go back again to share my screen. Uh, gosh. OK. Um, I'm sorry, could could you could could you just reshare? There is some. Yeah, yeah, some sure. I, I'm, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll I'll reshare my screen, no problem. But I don't know where is my uh, why is it not sharing? It's okay. Uh, for the copy, it should be okay in a minute. All right, it's uploading. It should be okay soon. All okay. right, so it's all good. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me go to present view. Da -da 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 -da. All right, so about the YouTube channel, uh, currently there are close to like 80 something videos uh, and I'll tell you why I'm doing this. So one main reason why I do this YouTube channel is because uh, when I travel to different countries, many developing countries, uh, just like your good, beautiful country of Ukraine, I feel a lot of very good scholars exist and they do a lot of good work. But because sometimes it's just not having enough resources to, uh, you know, be trained with methodologies or methods or different type of tools, uh, then it it is just not so good. I, I personally believe that knowledge should be freely available so that people can build upon their knowledge. And that's why this YouTube channel sort of I started with that intention and now it has becoming into a big thing and it's a good platform for many people to interact with. Um, so if you go and check out the videos, you will see that there's a lot for you to learn um, uh, from, right? So a lot of interesting videos. Um, anyways, I'm not going to go into this anymore. Uh, I'm going to skip this. There are 79 people, I think, right now. We cannot do this uh, with 79 people. <laughs> it's going to take a long time. Uh, okay. Let me tell you, uh, start from here. So let me start from uh, my experience with research. So how did it start, uh, my experience with research, right? So I did my master's in UK. At that time, I was interested in research, but not so much. Uh, I knew that I wanted to go for PhD, but it was so-so, right? So uh, then after UK, I went to Malaysia for my PhD. So that's exactly where my um, research uh, experience started, right? So I started my PhD, uh, there's a business school, I went there and then I spent around three years there. So there was a lot of research going on, obviously because of PhD, but then also because I was quite active. So uh, we had a room and that room had all the PhD students from my department come into every morning. Uh, from nine till five or six in the evening, and we had a lot of discussions there, right? So this is where my research journey really started, learning research and stuff like this. Then um, there's a group on Facebook right now. It's uh, one of the largest support groups for uh, researchers called Doctorate Support Group, right? Uh, so this group, many uh, researchers, they share their stories, they share their problems, they share their questions, and then and there's a bunch of people like me who also respond to many posts here, try to answer the questions or try to provide some support or some uh, motivation, right? So uh, again, when every morning I uh, wake up, I check out this group and see what, what's going on. So looking at those posts and looking at what people are sharing there, this also contributes a lot to my own research experience, right? Because learning how people feel about research or what type of problems they are facing, um, it's something very interesting. It, it teaches me also a lot, right? So that's what it is. Then when I was in Malaysia, uh, when my PhD was about to finish, I worked at Taylor's University for almost one and a half year um, as a research um, associate. So my job there was uh, not to write papers. Uh, I mean, of course, I was writing papers, but um, here 
I work on research projects with a couple of professors. So then what happened was I got to know that, uh, okay, so research is not only writing papers, but research is also doing research projects and stuff like this, which was another different picture of research, right? So also contributed quite a bit into my own development as a researcher. And then currently um, I'm working um, uh, on uh, supervising students in different countries um, on their PhDs, on their masters. So again, uh, every day there is a lot to learn from all these interactions and research, right? Now, because of all this, I got to learn something very interesting. Okay, very interesting. But before I tell you what I learned, I want to ask uh, you guys one question. Okay, uh, so can somebody um, tell me if you have a dream organization, like an organization where you really want to work or something that you really want to achieve? Maybe Professor Hanna, you tell me if there's something like your dream organization. Of course, there is a Sloan Management School. OK, uh, so Sloan Management School, it's a pretty cool school, right? Uh, I mean, yes. So now I assume that um, you uh, one day your university, Sunny State University, sends you an email and say that a few professors are coming to Sunny State University from Sloan uh, Management School uh, for talks or they have to deliver some lectures and stuff like this, right? So normally you will be quite motivated to go and listen to them, right? Because it's your dream organization. You want to go there, you want to work there, and then obviously you want to go to listen to them. Now just assume for a moment that you go to this talk and then all these people who come from Sloan Management School, they start saying a lot of bad stuff about Sloan Management School and they say, oh, this is such a bad place to work. I don't know why we are working there and blah, 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 a lot of negativity. Uh, do you think it's going to destroy your motivation? I'm I I will not going to be convinced anymore that Sloan Management School is a cool place, but right. yeah, S sort it of. Could, right? it, I it, mean, it sort of has it. Like I will have now doubts. I will exactly. Have doubts right now. Why? I mean, something like this, right? So now. Just keep this in mind. At the same time, I want you guys to picture something. Sometimes we watch movies or something, right? And in these movies, there are support groups, right? Like, you know, support groups, maybe uh, people who are going through some difficult time in their life, they are all sitting around each other in a circle and then they share their stories and they try to support each other, right? Normally, support groups are like this, okay? So um, uh, what I realize about research, which is so funny, is this, OK? I just want to show you two pictures that I got from research support groups, OK? So this is one picture that I got from one of the support groups, OK? So it shows like a PhD journey, uh, registration, and then convocation, OK? And, and again, remember, this picture is taken from a research support group, and the support group is supposed to support you for research, right? Uh, similarly, uh, there's another picture um, that looks like this uh, and I'm pretty sure that most of you must have seen pictures like this, funny pictures or things like this, uh, sharing across, right? Like, okay, PhD is this, PhD is that. I have a good sense of humor. Like I look at this picture and I understand this is fun, this is a joke or something. But at the same time, what happens is that it creates a negative image of research, a negative image of PhD or stuff like this in people's head, right? Like what I gave you an example of Sloan Management School. So what happens is that uh, maybe you are not completely upset with PhD, but you might have some doubts like maybe it's difficult. Maybe I don't want to do it or something like this, right? So um, I just talked to some um, somebody today. <coughs> Can you all see the pictures or you cannot see the pictures? I'm sorry, uh, uh, these participants do not see the pictures, which is strange for me because I see them all types of headaches. I can read them. Yes, I uh, think it's all OK. I think maybe it's the Internet, Sedan. Uh, uh, so uh, I would recommend I would recommend to go out from the meeting and join us again. So I think everything's going to be OK. Just rejoin us. OK, we are here. We're here for you. Yeah. 
OK, so. Um, all right, so um, now again, when we look at these pictures, it creates some sort of a negative impression in people's mind, right? And I mean, I don't know how is it in your countries. Uh, you know, there's quite a few people from different places. I don't know. I know for my country that, you know, when kids are small, uh, then the parents normally have some dreams, right? They say, okay, I want my kid to become a doctor or I want my kid to become a uh, engineer or I want my kid to go to army or something like this. But I hardly see somebody say like, I want my kid to be a professor. <laughs> I don't hear that. I don't know why, but there's a lot of negativity about it, right? It's because of these type of things. Now, look, Normally, if I am an undergraduate student or if I'm a master's student and I intend to go for a PhD, right? If I am intend to go for a PhD, and you can think about your own experiences. When you talk to people, you say that I want to go for a PhD, 90%, 80% to 90% people are going to tell you something negative. If you tell somebody that I want to go for PhD, 80 to 90% people are going to tell you something negative. Oh, come on, like. So, and I'll tell you what are the most common comments. OK, so one comment is how much do you want to study? This is one comment that everybody says. Like when you tell somebody I want to go for PhD, they're like how long do you want to study more? The second one is are you crazy? This is another comment that many people get. <laughs> tell somebody I want to go for PhD. People say are you crazy? The third one is uh, all your friends are going to get jobs and uh, you are still going to study. Right. These are some general comments that many people get and it creates some 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 negativity around research. So even I have seen students who still get into PhD, the first one or two semesters are really a lot of doubt. They don't know what are they doing. They don't know what to do. I mean, this is reality, right? This is happening around us. And because of this negativity, People feel that getting a paper accepted, writing a paper, doing some research is just something so, so difficult, right? Just so difficult. I'm telling you this, that many people that I talk to, uh, they are scared of publishing. And if you ask them, how many papers have you published? None. How many papers have you got rejected? None. So even they haven't experienced it yet, they have a lot of scare, you know, like scared of it. So I think that's not a very good, good, good thing, right? So because here, here is what I will tell you. Uh, in army, right? When somebody wants to go to army and if they don't know how to swim, what do the army people do? They throw them in the water, right? Throw them in the water after some time they will learn swimming, right? Basically, you have to experience something to know what it is about, right? So if the if you have never experienced it, if you have never written a paper, if you have never submitted a paper to a journal, if you have never rejected a paper, if you have never got a paper rejected from a journal, how do you know it's difficult? It, it's just not possible for you to know. So um, my suggestion to all of you is at least try, you know, try. And even if your paper get rejected, that's OK. Like let the journal reject your paper. Do not reject your paper by yourself. Like many people reject their paper by themselves without even submitting a paper, right? So don't do that type of stuff. It's not a good idea. All right. So now, ultimately, because of this negativity, uh, people sort of hate research, hate research papers, and many times uh, this negative comments come from people who also don't publish a lot. Right, people don't publish a lot, and then they also try to demotivate others not to publish or something like this. I think it's just not a good idea. Okay, now when I say this, I also want to tell you this: not everyone who get into PhD may be good at publishing. You know, because people are different, right? So if let's say there are 100 students in a class uh, in the first semester of a PhD not all 100 of them are going to be really good at publishing and that's OK. So if as a person you believe that, you know, you have done enough, you have tried enough, but you don't get it or you cannot publish, I don't think it's a it's a bad thing because people are different, right? So the faster you realize, the better it is. Now, when I say this at the same time, I want to say this at least you should try in the start, right? Try as much as you can. 
maybe you, it will work out for you. Maybe you don't know things and you will learn them. But if after trying enough, if you as a person believe that you have tried enough and you still don't get it, you still cannot do it, then I think you should do something that you are really interested in rather than keep demotivating yourself, right? Because the more rejections you get, the more um, setbacks you get, the more uh, negativity it creates. So um, that's something that you as an individual need to be sure about, right? So me or Professor Hanna or anybody else cannot tell you this. You have to decide that thing for yourself, okay? All right, <clears throat> so when you have in this situation where you don't know what to do or where you are not um, understanding the research properly or whatever, what do we do then? What we need to do is we need to understand that research is not easy, okay? It is difficult. It's not impossible. It is difficult, but it's also not easy. It's not like that. I'll tell you a funny story about my PhD. So when I started my PhD, uh, <laughs> so I went to my supervisor, my first meeting with my supervisor and my supervisor asked me about my topic, right? It's like, what is your topic? So I told him my topic and my I, the topic that I told my supervisor was the same thing I did in my master's, which was service quality and customer satisfaction. So my supervisor told me that uh, it's not a good topic. It's already too old, right? You need to do something new, right? Um, so I said, okay, what do I need to do? He said to read, right? So he said, read as much as you can. So I went back home and I read one paper, two paper, and after the third paper, I couldn't read anymore. Like it was too much for me, right? So the third paper, I stopped. I cannot read anymore. So I go back to my supervisor and I told him that I read three papers. He was very upset with me. He said, like, are you kidding? Like, are you joking with me? How can you come to me with three papers? I said, I cannot read anymore, right? So he said, why, what's wrong? I said, I have got headache. Like the more I read, I get, I'm getting headache. I just cannot read anymore. So he told me that it's okay. Uh, the day uh, your headache stops is the day when your PhD finishes, right? So your PhD finishes and then your headache will stop. I think he was right because obviously you need to read a lot, right? And when you read a lot, why do you create uh, headaches? Like why do you get headache when you read a lot? Uh, there are several reasons. One is research papers are not normal writing. It's not like you are reading a storybook or something. It's very different, right? So there's a lot of information in a research paper. So one, it's not the same like what we are used to reading. Second, each research paper has a lot of information. So when you read one research paper, it gives you a lot of information overload, right? So the more you read, the more information you are getting. And obviously your brain is not used to it. Uh, so that's another one. And then the third one is, uh, Normally, research papers are written very boring, really very boring. Like if in the night you cannot sleep, you try to read one paper, you will sleep before you finish the paper. It's really boring. right? So we as human beings are just not used to that type of reading, right? So it creates um, confusion. But the biggest reason why it creates headache is this. If you are like me, OK, I get ideas all the time, like even when I'm looking at something, I get 10 different ideas from it. So what happens is when I'm reading a paper, I just cannot focus because when I'm reading a paper, every paragraph takes me to different places. And so the more I read, the more my brain is connecting it to different, different things. Right. So I get a lot of ideas. Now, of course, with that, it creates headache because my focus is all over the place, right? Which is a good thing at, at, at some time, but it also is not a very good thing because it makes more and more confusion, right? So I'm very sure that most of you, if you have uh, read enough papers, you would know what I'm talking about, that when you are reading a paper, it creates a lot of confusion because, you know, sometimes the paper is talking something that you don't know, or sometimes they talk about something that you think otherwise or stuff like this. Now, in this situation, what you need to do is this. OK, so remember always if you are stuck somewhere, ask for help. If if you are stuck, right, if you know that you are not proceeding further, everything is sort of blurred and it's creating headache and you don't know what to do. 
then ask for help instead of putting yourself more and more under pressure and demotivation and negativity i think it's a very good idea to ask for help but when you ask for help because you are all adults right you, you are not kids you also need to know how do you ask for help now every day i get several messages from people who need some help and it's okay i understand it but sometimes people ask me can i talk to you i um, i need some help and i'm like okay yeah sure you can talk to me no problem so this person then tells me please give me a topic for research that to me it's funny i mean how is it even a help like it's not help right um, and it happens so many times instead of this if you ask a professor um i have these two or three topics these are the two or three topics i come up with which of these topics is a good topic then it's a much better way of asking for help compared to asking a professor to give you a topic to research it's you know i mean it's pretty much the same thing but the way you ask for it also creates a lot of impressions right so people would remember you for how you uh, conduct yourself so make sure ask for help but at the same time you should be able to understand how to ask for it because uh professor hana most of the people in this session are phd students is that right they are very different there are phd students from first uh, year and we have faculty members uh, who already is doing research but still okay. we have the same fears because um when you are submitting the paper in top ranked journal there is always a fear to be rejected and you know and you choosing less uh how to say it? less reputable journal but more available i would say mm -hmm. and okay, that that no means problem. that you're not you're not going to even challenge yourself for a good solid research we have the same things i think phd students faculty yeah sure no problem so what i uh, the reason why i ask this is uh, so if you are a phd student and if you, or if you are a faculty member so normally if you are going to ask someone for help you are not going to go and ask an undergraduate student to help you find a topic or something right normally you are going to ask somebody higher in level right with more experience or stuff so now think about it you reach out to a full professor normally they are busy people so if if you are reaching out to someone who is an editor or somebody very busy they don't have time for jokes or kidding or something like this right so when you are asking for help at that time even the person who is going to help you would expect that you are prepared to ask your question right you, you should be able to know what exactly are you asking for so that people can help you right so um just something very important to keep in mind so uh, now let's go into what is research okay so in 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 my opinion uh research is uh, curiosity okay now this is a very cliche statement like uh, people might think wow i know this like why you are telling me but honestly if you think about it um a good researcher always is curious okay i don't know how many people work but the way i work i'll tell you a very interesting uh so sometimes i read papers that are not in my field at all i mean my area of research is consumer behavior but sometimes i read papers in engineering or computer science or something like this right now of course i don't understand the technicalities of that paper but i can get the idea what are they talking about right uh, honestly the, when i'm reading the paper in another field i want to understand what this paper is talking about but at the same time my brain is working on how can i bring this idea into consumer behavior like how can i connect this idea to consumer behavior research right uh, out of 10 papers i read and i feel like this maybe six papers i cannot make any connection but four papers i can make some connections out of those four two connections may not make a lot of sense but two of them make sense and then maybe one of them i pick up and do my work on right i can conduct my research on that and see what's going on so for research to be a good researcher i feel that the most important thing is curiosity you have to be curious about things around you right 
So um, another example I'll give you now is uh, COVID-19. OK, so this is something that is happening around us and we all are looking at how it has changed life, how it has changed things around us. Now, recently I uh, guest edited a special issue for uh, COVID-19 and hospitality and tourism industry. OK, so uh, if you look at this screen right now, there's a definition of research and this is my favorite definition of research, which says that research is formalized curiosity. It is poking and prying with a purpose means even if you are asking questions, it should have a purpose, right? So how, what do I mean by this? Uh, the special issue that I did for COVID-19 um, and hospitality and tourism, we received uh, 70 something abstracts for that special issue. Um, but most of them were rejected. I rejected most of the abstracts and there was a reason for it. So many topics uh, didn't make sense to me because many people, they just wanted to put COVID-19 in the title of the paper or probably the aim of the paper, but then it didn't make any sense. So let's say there's a topic the impact of COVID-19 on selection and recruitment. To me, uh, how can COVID-19 impact anything? I don't think COVID-19 is impacting anything as itself, but how can the changes because of COVID-19 in the job change selection and recruitment would make more sense, right? So COVID-19 itself doesn't do anything, but COVID-19 brings a lot of changes. Like people change the way they are working because of COVID-19 and that change in working style can impact a lot of things. So you have to be very clear on what you want to do and what is your purpose, right? So um, sometimes we see that many people, they try to find these type of situations like this COVID-19 as an opportunity to publish faster because uh, many times these type of things are really hot topics, right? Like COVID-19. So people believe that if you add COVID-19 into the title of your paper, you have a much better chance of getting published because it's a relevant thing, it's a recent thing. But at the same time, if you are targeting a higher impact factor journal, you need to be very sure on what are you doing and why are you putting COVID-19 in your title, right? So. Um, again, curiosity is important, but it should be formalized. It should make sense. It should have a purpose. OK. <coughs> All right, this is interesting. So why do we publish now? Uh, <laughs> when I go to different universities and I ask this question, I get these bookish answers, right? So people say I publish to find the unknown or I have published to, um, I don't know what, to find answers to questions or I don't know, a lot of things, okay? But honestly, uh, we published for maybe because it's required for our degree, right? So you are a PhD student, you need to publish to graduate, so you publish to graduate, right? I have seen this a lot. Uh, some people publish because they have funding, so you have funding, you have money from government or some other places and they require you to publish, so that's why you publish. Uh, sometimes you publish to get promotion, like I do it. Uh, if I'm an assistant professor, want to be associate professor, so you need to publish. Um, so these are some of the reasons why we publish, right? Now, interestingly, uh, none of the editors or reviewers are going to consider these reasons. So when you write a paper, right? And, and as an editor, I sometimes get these type of comments, okay? Uh, from author saying that, you know, dear editor, please accept my paper soon because I need it for my PhD degree or I need it for my promotion or something like this. But honestly, editors, reviewers, nobody cares about this stuff, right? Uh, maybe they do, but that's not the reason why your paper is going to get accepted. Like this is not the main reason why your paper will be accepted by a journal, right? Uh, at the same time, Publishing becomes important because you might be a very good researcher. Really, you might be a very good researcher and you might have written a very good research paper, but unless it's published, nobody knows it exists, right? So you can write a paper, you can keep it into your computer and nobody will know about it ever. So if you want someone to know about your research, you get need to get it published, right? But that publishing is not because of your PhD degree or funding or promotion or whatever. It needs to be entirely on how good is your research, not any other reason. Remember one thing, 
uh, these days we are in the time of uh, publishing business. So most of us <clears throat> want to publish in high impact factor journals, right? This is what it is, right? So you are an author, you are a researcher and you want to publish in high impact factor journal. Now, how do journals get high impact factor when they get more citations, right? How can journals get citations when the papers they are publishing are citable? Right? When people are going to cite those papers, right? OK, so as an editor, uh, my job is to find the papers that are going to attract more citations, not because the paper is important for someone's PhD or funding or promotion or something, right? But the papers that are going to get more citations, that's as an editor what my job is. So you as an author need to make sure that you are offering something in that paper that brings value to the journal. Only then your paper will be accepted. There's no other reason. OK. <clears throat> All right. Now the bookish definition of research is this one. OK, so this is important because it's going to explain a lot of interesting stuff to you. So one, it is a process. Well, remember that your research that you conduct, it's a process. What do we mean by process? So what, what it means is that you cannot create a research that is so new that nobody knows about it. You cannot do that because anytime you do it, people are going to ask you justification. Right? Put a reference to what you are talking about, right? So you cannot completely do a new thing and say this is a new thing. That new thing also needs to come from somewhere, right? So it's a process. So that's why in your literature, a very important uh, component is literature review. So you have a literature review, right? Because that comes from the past and then you do your research. And then after your research, you provide future research suggestions for other people to follow up on your research. Right, so it's a whole process that needs to continue. But then in this process, you are going to do one of two things. One is to seek or revise. Seek is something new, okay? So you are going to study something that nobody else has studied, okay? So it's a new thing. For instance, whoever studied a technology acceptance model for the first time, there was no technology acceptance model before that, right? So that's seek something new coming something new and then uh, this new thing can be facts it can be principles it can be theories it can be application of theories so it can be new for the first time nobody has done it you are doing it but research is also revising things okay that is very important to progress the scientific research right we, we cannot always assume that whatever is published is 100 percent correct so whatever is published always have a room to be revised. OK, for instance, uh, a few hundred years ago, people used to think that uh, sun, uh, Earth is at the center of the solar system, right? So our Earth was at the center of the solar system. A few hundred years ago, people used to believe it. But then somebody had to revise it to say, no, it's not the Earth at the center, but it's the sun at the center of the solar system, right? So it always um, has an opportunity or a cushion to revise the facts, to revise the applications, theories, and everything. So your research is not always coming up with something new. You can always revise things, and that can also be considered as a good research problem or a good research. All right. Uh, now the same thing uh, why do we do research right so there's a lot of reasons and i'm just going to put them here <coughs> so your right reasons to do research are not because you want to get your phd or promotion or funding they should be actually reasons like this and this is where your editors or journals would be interested in your research so if your research is to create or review or synthesize knowledge that is a good reason for doing research to provide solutions to a problem like right now the world is going through COVID-19. Both medical and non medical applications, right? So the medical application is of course the vaccines and things like this. But if you think about the non medical applications, what are those social distancing, right? So how to create social distancing, how to keep away from people. Uh, studying the masks, everybody is wearing masks, so nobody can see each other's face and stuff like this. So those are the non-medical applications. Of course, there are problems how to find solutions for them. So 
um, another reason. Uh, exploring general issues like right now in America, maybe a few of you might have uh, heard there's a new thing going on called Asian hate. Uh, somebody killed a few Asian people and it created a new uh, trend, right? So stop Asian hate. So now people are trying to understand why is it that um, in America there are a lot of cases against Asian people, right? So um, general issues or gun control is another general issue in the US right now, right? A big issue for a few years, gun control. So uh, sometimes you do research to understand those type of uh, things as well. So these are some reasons that you should use to conduct your research rather than those very internally focused reasons of getting promotion or PhD or stuff like this, okay? <clears throat> All right, so now uh, we need to also think about research problem, right? So we always talk about research problem and this is the starting of your research. So how do you come up with a research problem? Now, uh, the, the, the issue in my opinion with the research problem is uh, many of us, we only use one source to come up with a research problem and that source is research papers. Right? So when you want to do a research, um, like you want to conduct a research, you want to write a research paper, everybody is going to ask you to go and read previous literature and then come up with a research gap from there, right? So this is normally what we do. So you go to the previous literature and then you see what are the research gaps and then you come to um, uh, find a solution for that. Uh, I think that if you want to do a bit unique uh, research, right, a bit interesting research, something that is new, something people are interested in, I think you need to go back and you need to change the way you come up with a research problem. Research papers are good, but they are not the only way you can find a research question. I think what you need to do is, of course, ex existing literature is good, but also think about social issues. How can you connect social issues to the research problems? OK, so I don't know how many of you uh, work in uh, service management or service design or services marketing or something like this, but it's a major area, right? Services marketing, service design and stuff like this. So. Uh, in the last few years, um, in the whole world, there's a big problem and that problem is of refugees. I mean, most of you would know that there's a lot of people who are migrating from war areas to other areas as refugees, right? <clears throat> and when refugees go to some country, uh, they go with almost no money, right? I mean, because they, they, they leave their home to go to another place, so of course, there's not a lot of money that they can take with themselves, so, right? Uh, they go in a very bad situation to other countries and people have negative perceptions and stuff like this, which, which is a major general issue. It's a social issue, right? But in the last two or three years, uh, services management researchers are trying to bring this social issue into the domain of service no, services management. Uh, to see how can services be redesigned so that they can include the vulnerable populations like refugees, like, you know, people, um, LGBTQ or th th vulnerable populations. So you, that's also a good idea to bring social issues into your existing uh, context, right? Like into your research to see how can uh, things be dealt with. Then you can also use uh, ideas from workshops and seminars like this workshop that we are having, right? So in these type of workshops, um, and I'm sure that um, Professor Hannah, you are also inviting other professors to come and talk, right? So when all of you listen to these different professors, because their backgrounds are so different, they talk about their research, they give you a lot of ideas from their research. So you can also use those ideas to connect them to your research and come up with a unique idea that people are interested in. Um, then many of us always ignore our own experience. Like we as human beings also have a lot of experiences, right? So you might have... Um, you... I'm managing. Okay, you're managing. So... So if we think about this, um, we as human beings have a lot of um, uh, experiences, right? So we work somewhere, we are also consumers, we are also consuming things, we are also doing things. So you also think about 
what do you experience in your life and how can you study those phenomena that you are experiencing that can also give you some very good ideas to work on right uh, so th these are just some different ideas that you can look into in addition to existing literature which is going to develop your research into a much more attractive idea so that the journals and editors are interested in okay uh, remember this a good research starts with good research topics. So your topic needs to be really good for your research to be good, right? Uh, how can you come up with a good research topic uh, when you have a good understanding of the literature? What is happening in your field, right? So uh, how would you know that? You can only know that when you do a lot of reading. So the more you read, the better it becomes for you, right? Now, like I said, unfortunately, uh, we all focus too much on journal articles and we ignore other things, right? Like maybe blogs or social media or industry shows or magazines or things like this. Sometimes um, you would be surprised at how many interesting topics can you get from other sources. Now, let me give you an example. So <clears throat> right now, <coughs> right now, um, the industry, if you look at the industry, what the industry is doing, uh, they are way ahead of academic researchers. Okay, why is it? Because what happens is this, COVID-19 came, it's a big problem, the industry wants to solve the problem, they suddenly come with a solution and they implement it and they go ahead with it, right? Now we as academics, if we want to study something, first of all, we need for industry to implement it before we study it, <laughs> right? So I cannot study anything until it's not there, right? So first, um, I am already delayed because I need for industry to implement something and then I study that, right? So let's say if I'm studying something, um, just as an example, let's say I want to study uh, how uh, the design in hotel lobby like you go to a hotel, the lobby design influences people's feelings and emotions, right? If I want to study this, I need for the hotel to implement a design change and then I can study it, right? So the hotel already implemented it and then I'm already late in studying it, right? But now think about it. So hotel change it, let's say today, for me to study it, first of all, I need to get a lot of uh, approvals and things from my university which normally take a month or two months like you know ethical board and this and that and a lot of stuff so it delays me already by a month or two after that i start collecting data i analyze the data and then i write a paper then i submit it to a journal which takes another few months for revisions and everything and then when it's published it's already probably one and a half to two years old right it's already one and a half to two year old and now I ask my PhD student to go and read a paper to come up with a new idea. The paper that is already two years, two and a half years old uh, based on industry, right? So I think what you need to do is instead of focusing or focusing on journal articles, look at other things. Because when you read industry magazines, they are much more newer compared to journal articles. They talk about things right at that time, right? So industry magazines um, also try to go and see industry shows because sometimes what happens in these exhibitions and shows, they bring some tools and stuff that are not even implemented yet. They are just prototyping it, right? So you get to see things and then you can use them in your research. Social media is another very important tool that many people ignore. I think that there's a lot of stuff on social media that because social media things get viral, right? So sometimes things get viral very quickly and you can obviously use that um, thing to study <clears throat> and stuff like this. So I think that do not focus too much on journal articles and rather look at other alternates to come up with unique ideas. Okay, I'll, I'll show you some examples as well. So you see the picture on your slides uh, on your screens right now right okay so this is uh, i was traveling from boston airport to taiwan uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I went to the airport to the lounge and very interestingly after some time it was late in the night so i see something is running on the floor in the airport so i look at it carefully and these were mouse 
so there's mouse number one and then there's mouse number two, but they were running too fast, so I couldn't capture the picture correctly, right? So these are mouse running in the lounge in airport, okay? Uh, very interesting to me. I've never thought uh, that I'll see mouse running into the lounge, which is very cool. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, later in the same flight, <clears throat> Uh, when I got my food, right? So the, the bottom picture you can see, it's like the food in the airplane, right? But what's very interesting is if you look at this bread, right? This bread, somebody actually bite it. Uh, here is uh, one uh, picture. You see somebody bite it and then it was sitting in my plate. So um, I called the, the, the server and I asked them like, what is this? And <laughs> then this guy told me, Hold on a moment. So this guy told me, um, uh, give me a minute. Oops, what happened to my slides again? Okay, so yeah, so here. So I asked this guy to like, what's this? Then this person told me, hold on. Then this person went and got another bread in his hand and then replaced the bread. And this person is not wearing any gloves or anything, right? Which was too interesting to me. Like, uh, And then this airline is not a cheap airline. This airline is more or less uh, one of the best airlines in the world, Cathay Pacific, right? So. I look at this, I came back to America after Taiwan and then I was thinking about my this experience. Um, to me, it was very interesting. Uh, of course, I was dissatisfied uh, because of this. So I tried to look at some literature and then I realized that in airlines and airports, there's no literature on dissatisfaction. Like there, there is some literature on satisfaction and many people feel that if your score on satisfaction is low, then you are dissatisfied. Dissatisf but that's not the case. You are you may be less satisfied, but it doesn't mean you are dissatisfied, right? So um, that, that, that because of this, then we came up with a paper, understanding airport service cap on traveler dissatisfaction and misbehavior. And then this paper was published in Journal of Travel Research. But again, purely started from my experience as a consumer, my experience, then I look at my experience, look at the literature, I couldn't find much and then it ended up with this, this paper, right? So uh, one example on how you can create your own experiences into a research paper and this, I don't know if you know this or not, but this uh, journal is very difficult to publish in Journal of Travel Research. It's one of the high impact journals, too difficult to publish in, but it, it happened. Then another example is this one. <clears throat> so uh, I had a master's student from Romania, uh, Luana. Uh, Luana was doing her thesis, but she didn't know what topic should she work on and stuff like this. So no idea what's going on. We had some discussion about her topic, but still. Then uh, one day I was um, going to my office and on the way um, I got one email from hotel management. This is a magazine. It's an industry magazine, online magazine, right? So I look at this hotel management and they had a very interesting article about uh, public spaces promote wellness for guests and environment. So they um, had this um, article about how the public spaces and hotels can be used to improve the wellness of guests and the environment and stuff like this, right? So again, the same thing. Uh, we look at this. I told Loana that this seems like a good topic. And then we try to look at the literature. Again, not much about design elements in hotels. So we had some a lot of research on physical environment. Of, we, we, all, we had a lot of um, research. We have a lot of research on physical environment of hotels, generic one, right? Asking people, is this design good, bad, whatever, but not really about the design elements, right? So uh, the natural elements in the hotels and stuff like this. So Luana liked this topic. I also like this topic. Then um, this is the paper that came out of it. The effect of hotel lobby designs on booking intentions. So, in this one, what and, and simple, right? So I, we have a good friend. He owns a hotel. We went to his hotel. We took pictures of the lobby and then we photoshopped those pictures. So in one picture, we added plants. In one picture, we added uh, water, like a waterfall type of thing. Um, and then we asked questions of people about those lobby designs and stuff like this. So 
Again, this is another example of how not only you get the ideas from research papers, but also from magazines. So uh, these are just a couple of examples, um, you know, what I was saying. So <clears throat> normally what I do is this, okay? So let's say there's this article that I'm looking at. Um, the article is, what is green lodging and why is it important? I'm just telling you how normally I work, right? Like the workflow that can also help you coming up with ideas. So let's say I'm looking at this article and this article uh, talks about green lodging. So the first thing I do is I think about this concept and I think about how this concept is going to change anything for consumers. Like if I'm as a customer, I go to a hotel and they are doing this green lodging or whatever. How is it going to change anything for me as a customer? Like what would it do to me or, or how I do things, right? At the same time, I also think how is it going to change things for employees? Because my, my focus is human behavior, right? So human behavior would be consumer as well as employees. So, so if I look at this one, here are a couple of examples. So developing an extended theory of planned behavior to predict customers' intentions to visit green hotels, which is an offshoot of this, right? So there's a green hotel as a consumer, why would I stay at that hotel? Like what would make me stay at that hotel? So that was the idea. Or how employees' behavior and their performance would change if they have to work at a green hotel. Right? So again, you, you have a, an idea, you think about how this idea changes things for customers or employees, and then you proceed from there. Okay, uh, in my opinion, how should you start? It's like this. Pick up something that you are really interested in, okay? Pick up a topic that you are interested in. I have a friend, I think she was online here, Sedan uh, from Turkey. Uh, she is interested in robots, okay? So anything to do with service, robots, robots, she is interested in. So that's an idea. Um, you may be interested in something else. I don't know, whatever you are interested in, right? So maybe you are interested in customer emotions or you might be interested in uh, environmental concern, whatever you are interested in. So pick up something that you are interested in and then think about it. Uh, is it an antecedent to something that you are not sure about? For, is, for example, I am interested in uh, environmental concern, means I have a lot of concern about environment, the planet and everything, right? Um, okay, so I use this concept and I think about it. What can it lead to? Will it change my behavior? Will it change my behavior, purchasing behavior? Will it change um, my perception of people who don't care about environment? Like what is this concept going to change, right? This is one way of starting a good research. Or you can also think about it as a consequence of something. Okay, so environmental concern, why do I develop this concern? Like what are the factors that lead to environmental concern, right? So that is another question that you can tackle either way. So whatever concept you are interested in, either take it as an antecedent to something that you don't know, or either take it as a consequence of something that you don't know. So that's how you can position your research questions. Now, one example of this is here. This is one of my friends, a very interesting paper. So uh, hotel booking websites. Now we all know that normally when you book a hotel, you go to the website, right? So you go to the hotel booking website and then you book there. Okay, so what about, this is a concept, hotel booking website. What do I do with it? Here, so there are two pictures, okay? Let's say you go to a hotel booking website, there are these two pictures, it's the same hotel. You, do you see any difference in these two pictures? Well, apparently the people are there who are in, like, right. I don't know, having a pleasure being there yeah. as a visitors. Yes, so you have one picture with no people and you have one picture with people. Now, normally if I ask somebody, uh, do you like picture number one or picture number two? Maybe you guys can put in the chat who likes picture number one, who likes picture number two. Now, my experience with this uh, particular um, image is that there's an equal amount of people who like picture number one and there's an equal amount of people who like picture number two. Uh, but when you ask them, why do you like picture number one? 
people think because there are no people in it uh, and it looks much cleaner it looks much calm right um, and that's okay people who like picture number two if you ask them why do you like picture number two they think that picture number two gives you an indication of how big is the hotel because you can compare people with the hotel and then at the same time it also gives you more uh, you know like romantic or what can you do or what type of activities can you do in this hotel or you know stuff like that so because people think differently right so I started with a hotel booking website as a concept, but now when I go to hotel booking website, I see there are different type of pictures people are using. So I can definitely focus on pictures in the website, but what do I study? What's the benefit? Like what benefit do people see having a picture on the website, right? How do you use it to book? What about videos instead of pictures? I mean, these are all different research questions that you can question in your head to come up with a unique idea, right? All start from one concept. Uh, how about 360 degree images, like not static image, but an image that can move, like you can move it with your mouse. What happens then? How about there are human beings versus no human beings in pictures? Right? Even these two pictures that I just showed you here, it would have a very complete, completely different um, uh, perception if there was a dog swimming in the swimming pool. Right? I mean, there are a lot of swimming pools that are pet friendly, right? So it would have a complete different image then. So this is what you need to think about to come up with unique ideas because there are hundreds and hundreds of papers on hotel booking websites but there's no paper on how the pictures are used on websites. So sometimes you need to dig deeper into the concept that you are really, really interested in. And then this is the paper. OK, so if you look at the model, the model is very cool. Now let us I have one other very quick question. So this these two pictures when I showed you these pictures, right? How many of you picture yourself inside there? Like how many of you think that you are there in that place? Does it make that type of sense? Yes, no. Sometimes when you are traveling in airline, right? Like airplane, they have some very interesting magazines, right? Uh, travel magazines, you see different destinations, islands, this and that. Many times you look at the picture, many times you feel that if you are there, like it's a sort of a transportation, right? Pictures do this type of stuff. And then if we look at this image, very simple, very simple model, okay? Size of the photograph, which was if the picture is small or big, presence of human being, and then a mix of them, size into human image. Does it create perceived transportation? Like, does it make you feel in the picture? And then how does it impact your booking intent? Very simple. And there's no complication in this model. It's a very simple model. It's published in number one hospitality journal, which again is too difficult to publish in, but the topic itself is unique. Now, again, I want to focus here that this topic is not too complicated. Like if you look at the model, it's not complicated. So it's not about how complicated is your model. It's about how unique is your study, like that nobody else has done before, right? So this is what um, you can focus on. <clears throat> Another example is this. So uh, sometimes what you need to do is this. Think about it. Uh, the, in every field, right? In every field, whatever is your field, there are certain things um, that are considered as a fact. It means everybody believes them, right? Everybody know that this this is true. Uh, so, for instance. Customer satisfaction impacts customer loyalty. Anybody who um, studies marketing or consumer behavior know this, that if you are satisfied, you will be loyal, right? So if you are satisfied with any product or service, then you are loyal to that product or service. Uh, so it's a fact, it's everyone knows it. However, uh, there was an article in Harvard Business Review and that article said that customer satisfaction is not enough to create loyalty. Like satisfaction is not the only thing that creates loyalty. There may be other things, right? So my PhD research was same. So it was like, okay, so there's like hundreds and thousands of papers and researchers who say that satisfaction creates loyalty. However, recent research says that satisfaction is not enough for loyalty, right? 
So what is the question here? The question here is that, OK, if satisfaction is not enough for loyalty, then what creates loyalty? Right? I mean, normally this is the logic, right? So you know that everybody says satisfaction creates loyalty, but now people are saying that in some contexts like luxury consumption, luxury products or resort pro hotels, uh, satisfaction doesn't create loyalty. So then what creates loyalty? So here is where I was stuck. OK, I don't know uh, because I'm stuck. So now what I do is the next step is go and find a review paper. Find a paper that reviews a lot of literature. OK, so this review paper right now in front of you that this one is about customer loyalty, a review and future directions with a focus on hospitality industry. So this paper is reviewing a few hundred papers that are focusing on loyalty in hospitality industry, right? So I look at this review paper. In the end of this paper, they have at least 20 to 25 ideas about loyalty, like how should you study loyalty? OK, so here, for example, it says engagement impact on loyalty, not satisfaction, engagement. So engagement is a different thing, right? And my question was the same, that satisfaction does not create loyalty. So what creates loyalty? So now I have one variable here, engagement, customer to customer interaction and, and, and its influence on loyalty, impact of customer commitment on loyalty, customer value co-creation, uh, green orientation, uh, opinion leaders. And the, so now you see that I am getting more and more variables that I can study in my model, not satisfaction, more and more variables. And each of them can create a very interesting, unique study. Right. So this is the logical flow that I personally follow for my own research. OK. Review papers. Um, are sometimes very, very, very important. So please make sure uh, that uh, you focus on review papers if you are a PhD student to come up with a very interesting paper. OK, uh, the time is limited, so I'm going to skip a couple of these things. Um, this slide that you see right now, I'll not talk a lot about it because there's a whole video on my channel on research gap. I'd highly recommend you to watch that because it goes into too detail on how do you find and write about research gaps, right? So that we need to focus on the problems of research. So I'm just going to go here. Uh, yeah, so um, the other thing from where you can get ideas, so we are still on ideas. The So one, I told you the idea is review papers, but then the other way on how you can find ideas is special issues. So go, but again, remember, don't go to lower level or mid tier journals for uh, getting good ideas. Always go to the top tier journals, like really high impact factor journals. Um, and see what type of special issues they have open, like open call for special issues, right? For instance, this one right here is uh, from Journal of Academy of Marketing Science, right? So Journal of Academy of Marketing Science, they have these three uh, special issues right now. Number one is artificial intelligence and robotics in the retail and service sector. Number two is digital technologies. Number three is scarcity. You know, scarcity is something like when you go to a website and you are buying something and it only shows you one left, hurry, two left, be quick, something like this, right? So then you feel like you should buy it quickly. Uh, so when you click on this call for special issue, either any of them, right? When you click on them, then you will see that inside there, there are 12 to 15 different specific topics that you can focus on. Um, so you can see here, for, this, for example, um, assessing re-engagement strategies to reaffirm or renew customer relationship and address customer complaints and blah, blah, blah. So you can all always pick up one of these and then continue with research on that one. So even if you're not submitting for that special issue, you can always do it for another journal or something, but it can give you some new ideas to work on, some new cutting edge research, right? Another example is this one. This is Journal of Marketing Management. This one is this special issue is focusing on understanding the effects of social distancing on consumer and business practices. So if you look at all these topics, they are focusing on social distancing and uh, consumer practices, right? So it gives you more ideas to work on. Uh, then this one is from Journal of Service Theory and Practice about COVID-19. Um, so these are just some 
things that you can do. Now for review papers, like I mentioned earlier, most of, again, uh, make sure that if you are doing this for getting the topic, then only focus on top tier journals. If, if you go to mid tier or lower tier journals, then it's not going to give you good topics to work on, right? So this one, right now in marketing, Journal of Academy of Marketing Science publishes a lot of very, very good review papers, really solid. Um, so this one, for instance, this paper is about impulse buying. And then if you look here in the end, table 19, it gives you research direction. So there's a lot of research questions that they provide that you can work on, right? So these are some topics that you can focus on. All right, so um, with uh, this, I'm going to finish the idea section. And then now we may move on to the next section, which is what makes a good paper. So you do a paper and then I do a paper. One of them is good. One of them is not very good. How do we, how do we make this decision on which paper is good versus which paper is not very good, right? So there are a few things. Number one is originality. So remember that this is, if you are targeting a good journal like a SSCI journal or a good journal, this is number one question that people are going to ask you. What is new about your study? And what is new about your study? Now, in fact. Some journals have already started this where they where they now ask you also when you are submitting your paper and everything to also submit 150 to 200 words statement. They call it impact statement it means what is new in your study that nobody else knew about. So it's not an abstract. It's not an abstract at all. It's something called impact statement, right? So you need to provide it and that means what is new in your study. So when we say what is new in your study, it can be your subject. By subject, we mean maybe the topic is new, the model is new, or maybe your um, your population is new. Means your the, the population that you are focusing on, nobody has studied it before, it's a new thing. Or maybe your methods are new, right? Nobody has used those methods before. Or maybe your results are new. Right? Your results are new, nobody knew about them before. So that originality is the most important thing. Number two is relevance to an extension of existing knowledge. So this again, like I said earlier, research is a process. So when you do this research, you need to make sure that you have done a solid literature review so that people know what is the existing literature talking about. But then also in the end, you need to attach, uh, you need to match your findings to the previous literature. So if you have some findings that are similar to previous literature, you need to mention that. And if you have some findings that are different from previous literature, then you also need to mention that. Okay. Uh, methodology uh, here is where many people make a mistake, and that is when you are talking about methodology, many people explain what methods that they use, right? So let's say they say that my sample size is 200 or I used questionnaire. That's not enough. You also need to provide an explanation on why are you using that method? So not only what method have you used, but also why have you used that method so that you know reviewers and editors can make a judgment on um, the validity and uh, objectivity of your methodology. Then your communication. Uh, this many people ignore. OK, um, this is important because uh, you can write a very good research. I mean, you can conduct a very good research, but nobody would know it if you do not communicate it properly. OK, just assume that you go to a doctor uh, because you are feeling very sick and everything, and then the doctor asks you what is your problem and you cannot communicate it. So the doctor is not going to be able to do anything because you cannot communicate your problem, right? So the same case goes with the research paper. So your research can be very good, but how would anybody know if you do not communicate it properly? Right. So communication and the way you write your paper becomes um, extremely, extremely uh, important. And then the last one is your argument should be convincing and logical, right? So this um, mainly is important for your introduction section because you mainly make arguments in your introduction, which is research gap and research problem. Uh, <clears throat> like I said earlier, anything that you write here, right? Like why are you conducting this research should have some sort of 
a logic behind it. It should make some sense. Like, why are you saying this? Unfortunately, many people miss this one. Um, many times what happens is that in the introduction, paragraph number one, two and three talk about a lot of different things. And then paragraph number four says, therefore, my study's objective is this, but it doesn't have any connection. So that type of thing is not a good idea, right? So whatever you write should be uh, logical and it should have some sort of an argument. OK, there are these three things. Oh, oops, uh, theoretical and practical implications. So this many people might have told you already about theoretical implication and practical implication. I personally believe that um, we actually do unnecessarily too much of a focus on theoretical and practical implications in journals, but this is how the game is like. This is what you are required to do, right? So whatever your findings are, whatever your findings are from your study, you need to think about it. How these findings are um, increasing our understanding of the theory. So whatever theory uh, already people knew, how your findings are in improving our understanding of it. So you need to write it. Now, uh, many people believe that when it comes to theoretical and practical implications, you have to write too much. That's not true. I mean, you can write it into a short paragraph. That's OK as far as you are communicating it properly, that this is my theoretical implication. You don't have to write five pages or four pages or something. Even one paragraph is OK. But that should be really focusing on what is it that your findings are telling us about theory. And then, uh, same is the case with practical implications. So whatever you find, because most of us are business management, broader business management um, students, right? Or sociology students or whatever, right? But social sciences or um, so whatever our findings are, it should have some sort of an implication for practice, whatever business management or hotels or airlines or whatever. So we also need to provide some answers for that, like what our research means for them. How can they change their stuff? Uh, references uh, become important as well because it's a process, so you cannot position your study out of your domain, right? So your study should be within that domain. Now, I'll just show you some examples of the reviews that I have done, and these papers were rejected. So if you look here, um, point number two, it says authors also discuss the importance of in-flight meals and the need for this study. However, the references provided to justify the study are outdated. So I reviewed this paper in 2020. Um, the, the references provided were 2011, 2010, 2005, which is quite old, right? So it doesn't show that this study is really relevant today. <clears throat> so um, similarly, there's another example. Uh, it says after reading the introduction, I feel that authors have tried to put together a bunch of variables to make the model seem complicated. I'm unable to see the justification for study for whatever little rationale is provided. It's backed up by outdated references, the latest one being from 2012. So uh, this just gives you an idea of how important it becomes that you use relevant, but also recent references because your study needs to be positioned in the current discussion about that topic. Okay. Uh, internationality. This is again very important. So um, I have another very good friend, Professor Dimitris Buhalis. He is editor in chief for Tourism Review. Uh, he coined a term called uh, my mother's village. I call it my grandmother's village. <clears throat> and what it means is this. Sometimes when you talk to your grandmother or mother who is living in village, then they all they talk about is their village. Uh, my village was good, my village was like this, my village was hospitable, people were nice, food was delicious. They don't talk about anything else. <clears throat> Unfortunately, many researchers are doing the same thing. So when you write a paper, let's say you did a paper about uh, Sunny. It's a place in Ukraine, right? What does it mean for somebody sitting in uh, Florida? Maybe nothing. And then let's say you are focusing on a small area, but then you submit that uh, paper to an international journal of tourism research, which is an international journal. So it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Now, how can you deal with this? So <clears throat> to deal with this, um, there's always a good idea, and that is to do comparative study. 
So let's say if you are doing a study on Sunny, like some 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 uh, something about Sunny, you can always compare it to some other place that is similar to Sunny. Maybe in another country, maybe in another place, and see what are the differences, what are the similarities, right? So that comparison can really make um, uh, your study stand out. Another way of doing it is that okay, maybe you don't have somebody who can conduct this study with you in another place, so then you need to find some studies that are done on similar topics or similar destinations or similar things, and then you compare your results to those results specifically to provide a better international flavor to your study, right? But this is important, internationality. Uh, making sure that you follow the editorial scope of the journal is also very important. So you should know in your field that what type of papers each journal is publishing, okay? Uh, so Professor Hannah earlier said that she is interested to work in Sloan Management um, School. They have a journal, it's called uh, Sloan Management Review, right? Uh, but uh, that journal is very different from, uh, let's say, Academy of Management Journal, right? Or maybe uh, MIS Quarterly or something like this. So you need to know what type of papers these journals are publishing in your field, right? You should be very sure about this. So now, for example, for me in hospitality and tourism, uh, there's a journal, that journal is called um, Cornell Quarterly, okay? So Cornell Quarterly, I will never uh, publish in Cornell Quarterly because they publish papers that focus too much on um, uh, industry-related papers. Like they, they publish papers that are really focusing on industry. My papers are not like that. My papers focus on theory. So I know this and that's why I don't submit my papers to Cornell Quarterly because I know what type of papers they publish, right? So it's important. Then the last thing here is the title. So this is again very important because uh, uh, you know, when reviewers look at your paper, the only thing they see in the start is the title and the abstract. And it becomes very important that you know what type of title or how attractive is your title. Let me ask you people this. Do you guys know what is this uh, formula for? Okay, if you don't know, I also don't know. Uh, because I just got it from Google. Uh, <laughs> it's just, I just wanted to find a complicated formula. But then I realized this formula is for Kronbach Alpha, right? So now you, most of you may know what is Kronbach Alpha, right? So Kronbach Alpha formula was there. So if we look at this Kronbach Alpha, uh, many people use it in their research, right? But there, there was a bunch of researchers who thought that uh, Kronbach Alpha or coefficient Alpha is uh, already outdated. It's already outdated. So they wrote this paper, okay? But if you look at this paper, interestingly, what is the title? Uh, Thanks coefficient alpha, we'll take it from here. Now, with, which is a very unique title, right? But at the same time, it's a very clever title because <clears throat> Kronbach alpha um, in statistics is, I, I guess not only statistics, everybody uses it. I mean, if you are even doing regression or structural equation modeling or whatever, you use Kronbach alpha, right? So um, there's a big group of people who love it, who use it, and there's a big group of people who hate it. Now, if you look at this title, this title is sort of bringing in both the groups because it says, thanks, Kronbach Alpha, we'll take it from here. So it's like they are thanking the people who use it, and at the same time, they are bringing something new onto the table, right? So it's a very interesting topic um, uh, title. Then after this paper was published, then um, the next year, um, there is another bunch of people who criticized this paper and they thought that no, Kronbach Alpha is still good. And then this paper uh, was published. And if you look at the title, it says, thanks coefficient alpha, we still need you. Uh, so this was another uh, paper published as a uh, response to the previous paper. But if you think about the titles, they're very unique, very cool, right? It, it draws in people to read the paper. So it's very eye-catching and stuff like this. Um, all right, let's <clears throat> move a little bit to some common mistakes. So these are some mistakes that are not going to get your papers rejected. Uh, but if you have multiple of them in your paper, then possible your paper can get rejected, right? So one is formatting problems and you won't believe how, how common is this. So many people are making this mistake with formatting. The paper is not properly formatted or 
uh, authors do not read the um, author guidelines about formatting and stuff, which is not a good idea. Sending it to the wrong editor or journal. So sometimes what happens is that you write a, a cover letter and then your paper gets rejected. Then you don't change too much, but send it to another journal without changing the name of the editor or the journal or stuff like this, which I don't think it's going to reject your paper, but it's not a good impression for you as an author, so it's not a good idea. Uh, grammatical and spelling mistakes. Uh, sometimes there are too many references, which clearly shows that you cannot read all those references, and sometimes there are too few references. And then sometimes also there are missing references, which is again a common mistake not good. Uh, <clears throat> revealing identity of authors. Now, this is something which is a bit uh, different for each journal. So I know that there are several journals that have some uh, regulations. So if you reveal your identity in the paper, uh, then they can block you from that journal for maybe six months or a year. Uh, some journals won't do anything. They will just ask you to remove your name and then resubmit the paper. Uh, tables and figures are missing, uh, your abstract is missing, and then also sometimes you work with a group and each team member works on a separate area in the paper, so then there are multiple writing styles in, in the paper, so which is not a good idea also. So these are common mistakes, but these are non-fatal, right? So it's not going to get you rejected. Then main reasons for rejection. This is common. Uh, this will get your paper desk rejected if your paper is not positioned for the journal. So let's say if the journal is about uh, hospitality and then you submit a paper from banking to that journal, uh, not going to work. Um, if you don't know what is the contribution of the paper, then again, um, it can reject your paper. If you do not answer the so what question, uh, these are some reviews. I'll just skip them for now. <clears throat> OK, this is also important. OK, so when we write a paper in the start, everybody is very excited, right? So when you start writing a paper, everyone is excited in the introduction. People write about a lot of stuff. Uh, then you do literature review, which takes a long time. It already make people tired in methodology and uh, fine data collection. People get a lot of problems. Sometimes data is not good. It takes a long time. Analysis is also problematic. So by the time people reach the conclusion, they really want to finish the work. Like right? let's just get it done, right? And then the paper becomes something like this. So you start introduction very good, very well positioned, promise a lot, and then by the time you reach the uh, conclusion, then it's like, oh my god, just finish it, right? So many times people ignore that. Okay, I also promised to do mediation analysis in introduction, but I didn't do it in my finding and analysis, right? So those type of things. Uh, not a good idea. Don't do that type of stuff. Uh, many times people write their PhD dissertation or master's thesis and later they convert that into a publication, right? So it's already a couple of years passed between that and then nobody updates their literature review. So let's say if you did your PhD in 2018 and now you are submitting that paper to a journal, your literature review should be updated. You should add recent references and everything into a literature review so that it's all good. Um, and like I said, inconsistency where your sections do not connect very well. OK. Uh, your uh, if your study have major methodological problems that can lead to rejection, I'll tell you why. Because let's say if your study have some issues with uh, analysis or if you did not write about a theory or something, you can always do it in revision. But if your methodology is problematic, then you cannot do uh, it again, right? Unless you recollect data, unless you recollect stuff, and then it's not necessarily the same paper. It becomes a new paper. So that's why if your study have major methodology problems that it then it can lead to a rejection. A replication of a previous study. So sometimes if you are replicating a previous study means there's a study already done. You are conducting the same study in a new context in a new country. Maybe your country. Nobody has done it before. Uh, this is again a topic that doesn't have a right answer because there are many journals that uh, reject a paper for replication, but then also there are many journals that require replication because replication bring changes and differences and it shows how things are different in different countries and stuff like this. 
Now, my suggestion is if anybody of you is doing a replication study, means if you are doing a study that somebody already did in another country and you are doing it in, a, in your country, then your focus of that study should really be on the differences between these two countries, the cultures and stuff like this, so that everyone knows why are you doing this replication. Okay, so um, plagiarism, um, you all should know by now that it's a big no-no, it's not a good idea. Um, if you are not telling an interesting story, what do we mean by interesting stories? Sometimes it's all about how do you look at things differently, okay? I'll give you an example. Do you guys know what is this picture? Like, which theory is this one? Maslow, man down. Maslow. Maslow, right? Recently, uh, yeah, so recently this Maslow hierarchy of needs was changed a little bit and it becomes something like this, uh, which if you think about, um, it's pretty much the reality, right? So wherever you go, you need Wi-Fi, but before Wi-Fi, battery is important. So if, uh, all of you, when your phones become less than 20%, it makes your hand itchy, like, oh my God, where's the, where's the charger or something. Even before COVID, when you used to travel, where are most of the people sitting in the airport? It's the place where they can charge their phone, <laughs> their iPads, right? So uh, that this becomes a reality. But if you think about it, this is a very unique way of telling the story that, you know, uh, Wi-Fi, our phones, our battery have really taken the basic uh, place into the necessities of our life. I mean, of course, you don't do this in research papers, but it's just an idea of, you know, how um, telling an interesting story can become uh, something cool. If you do not respond to reviewers' comments, so now this is again important. So let's say you submit your paper to a journal and then you get a revision. Now, first of all, you should be happy that you're getting the revision, which means that the editors still think that your paper has got some sort of strong point. Right? You can still fix it, right? So you should take that opportunity really, really seriously. Like make sure that you are um, responding to each comment properly so that you increase your chances of getting published. Unfortunately, uh, many people, they are not used to criticism. Many of us are not used to criticism, especially if you are doing a lot of work, then you feel your work is really perfect and we don't take criticism seriously, right? So when we get reviewer comments, we normally want to either fight with the reviewers or either not do much of the changes. So don't do that. I mean, if you are getting a revision, that already means that you have an opportunity to get your paper published. So take it seriously and work hard on it. All right, so Professor Hanna, I'm gonna stop here. <coughs> There's a couple of things left, but I think because of the time, I'm gonna stop here and we can take some questions now. Of course, thank you very much. So actually we had questions uh, during your presentation, but I was not, um, you know, I was too polite to ask them. Uh, so there is a one first uh, came from Hardwing Charlie Durai, who asked about the hypothesis. Hypothesis, should hypothesis be first and next followed by objective or objective first and then hypothesis next? Okay, so <clears throat> this again, I mean, it, it really depends on the format of the journal, like what journals are requiring, but the most common format is where your objectives are first and then are your hypothesis, right? Because you cannot hypothesize something if you don't intend it to, right? So normally your research problem comes first, then are your objectives, and then based on your objectives, you hypothesize things. Um, so normally the easiest uh, flow is you have introduction, your objectives go into your introduction, then you do your literature review, which includes your hypothesis development, then methodology, findings, analysis, and conclusion. So this is what I would say. Okay, thank you very much. If you have any other qu questions or you want to have something in detail, please type it again, and I uh, hope you're satisfied with an answer. Another question is uh, from Hadwing Charlie. Uh, will review paper also have same value as research paper in UGC care list? What is this list about? Um, I think it's kind of evaluation list. Um, okay, so I, I don't know about UGC care list. Maybe if you can tell us uh, a little bit, we can look into that. 
uh, again, this because there are so many different lists and there are so many different criteria in different countries, uh, we cannot say. I mean, for me, in my university where I work, it doesn't matter if you are doing a review paper or a full paper as far as it's published in a good journal, right? So it doesn't matter. Uh, now, <clears throat> I would say this. Uh, journal of Academy of Marketing Science is one of the best journals in the world. OK, and they publish a lot of review papers. So I would rather have one review paper published in Journal of Academy of Marketing Science than five papers published in second year journals that are not review papers. Right. So uh, it depends on your, your universities, like what are the regular? I know I know this, that in many universities they do not accept review papers as a paper, as a full fledged research paper. They don't. Uh, so you have to check your university for that one. OK, thank you very much. So um, the, the question was about the presentation and again, the uh, our video will be uh, uploaded on YouTube channel. At the same time, you can go to uh, Dr. Ali Fizan channel, research based, and you can follow his uh, uh, speakers and lectures. OK, next question is how many hypotheses do you normally use in your papers? Uh, H1, H0 and submit one of it in results section. Um, <clears throat> OK, so um, <laughs> the maximum hypothesis I've ever used in my study are 11. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule. I did a review paper recently on uh, the use of partially squares uh, in um, hospitality research. So for that, we reviewed uh, quite a lot of papers that are published. So. I know from that review paper that uh, the minimum amount, the minimum number of hypotheses in in any published research in SSCI hospitality and tourism journals is two, uh, and the maximum is seventeen. I mean, this is a, based on my review of all the published papers, right? Um, the reason why I'm saying this is because there's no rule. I mean, there's no rule that you cannot have 20 hypotheses or you cannot have five hypotheses or something like this. Now, you as researchers should think about how much can you manage. Or why I'm saying this is because when you have too many hypotheses, that means you should have too many variables in your model, right? I mean, only if you have too many variables, then you have too many hypotheses. The more variables you have, the more questions you have in your questionnaire. Right? I mean, if you have 20 variables in your questionnaire, then you have maybe 150 questions in your questionnaire. And the lengthier your questionnaire, the less data quality you have. Because when the questionnaire becomes long, then people cannot really focus and read it and the data have problems, right? So all these things you need to think about uh, from the start, like how many hypotheses do you want to keep? How many variables do you want to keep? How long will be your questionnaire? What is going to happen with your data quality and stuff like this? Uh, I think normally 10 to 11 is OK to manage. It's fine to manage 10 to 11. Thank you very much. There is a question from Shruk Hamad. Um, you have a question you want to ask in voice, right? Yes. Go on. Yes. Can you hear me, please? Yes, 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 I have a question. Yeah. Um, uh, what would be your advice to starting academics? So those, I mean, I, I got my PhD and um, I'm trying to publish now. I'm just starting. I'm not sure exactly um, where to start. Uh, would you advise me to try to shoot for the stars and go with probably um, Q1, Q2 journals or maybe just try to be more realistic and start from the bottom. I'm not really sure where to start. So uh, what would you advise me to do? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel that I should just go ahead and, and you know, try to, to do my best and try to be ambitious. But I'm worried that maybe I'm too ambitious and maybe this is not good uh, at this point of my career. So what would be your advice at this point? Sure, it's a very good question. So um, I'll tell you this. Uh, look, it depends on you as a person. Uh, what do you want to do? OK, so I'll tell you my experience. I the first paper I ever wrote, I sent it to uh, <laughs> the best journal in hospitality and it was rejected in three days. Um, <laughs> 
and now I am associate editor for that journal. Uh, it's a cool, cool experience, you know, but uh, from that I realized that, OK, I need to learn a lot of stuff, OK? And then my first two papers were published in journals that were not even in Scopus, uh, probably in Google Scholar or something, right? So, uh, but, you know, what it did was it got me a little bit motivation that, OK, I can publish. Maybe it's not a good journal or whatever, but I can publish like it's a good motivation right and then from there I thought okay now I should try a bit higher so then I started publishing in Scopus I published 12 to 15 papers in Scopus uh, so I started my PhD in 2012 September <clears throat> I finished my PhD in April 2015 my first SSCI paper was published in December 2015 six months after my PhD finished uh, and right now I have 40 plus uh, SSCI publications in the last six years. Uh, so uh, the thing is this, if you as a person want to learn, right, if you want to learn, then I would suggest to start from the bottom so you can learn, learn the whole process, um, you know, uh, how to write, how to review how to respond to reviewer comments, you know, and along the way, the more publications you get, the more motivation you get to proceed, right? Now, I'm not saying that maybe you are very intelligent. Maybe you can publish in an SSCI journal on the first go, and that's completely fine. But uh, when that happens, uh, it actually, I've seen many people who do not appreciate the value of publishing them. Like when you, all of a sudden, you target something high, you get it, and then, you know, at the same time, there's a chance that you get rejected and many people get rejected, right? Because you don't really know how to do it. And then that creates a lot of negativity. And that's why I feel that if you start from the bottom and make your way up, then you are learning a lot along the way. Thank you very much. I had the same story. Actually, I was rejected from very reputable journal when I was trying to submit and now I am a member of the editorial board of that journal, so you just need to try. OK, the, we have another question. It took me eight years anyway, but anyway, OK. <laughs> um, but it was worth it. Uh, OK, so what is what is the best way, Nikita Petrenka is asking, what is the best way the reporting about result of research and results section combine text with tables or graphs, or do you refer to some software such as statistics and others that helps you to analyze da data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, it's a good question. I would say, Nikita, it depends on you. What exactly do you want to analyze, right? So. Uh, we have really simple softwares, um, like you can also use Microsoft Excel to do a lot of analysis. You can use SPSS and then you also have really high level uh, coding based softwares like R and Stata and that type of thing. So it depends on what you want to do. Now, when I say that uh, it depends, it's just like this. Uh, everybody wants to travel by air, but you don't take an airplane from your home to your university and your city, right? It's just not going to work. Uh, it's, just, it's just not going to work. So uh, there are a lot of very powerful softwares, but if you don't use them, you don't use them. I mean, if, if something that you all you want to do is, let's say, descriptive statistics or mean scores or just frequencies and stuff like this, you can do it with Excel or SPSS. You don't need to use really complicated softwares. Uh, but let's say if, you're, uh, if your model and your hypothesis and everything is very complicated, where you look at regression and correlation and stuff like this, then obviously you use other types of softwares. Uh, what you need to know is that these days, to, with the technology and everything, you have every type of software available. So you just need to know what exactly do you want to do, and then you use that software accordingly. Okay, thank you very much. There is another question uh, from Hadwin Charlie Dwai. You raised, raised your hand and then you put that in a chat, so I will read it. Uh, is it necessary to have hypothesis so we can do uh, research with only objectives? Um, so, it, uh, look, uh, most of these questions would depend on what you are doing, right? So, this question, uh, the answer is yes, it's necessary, and also no, it's not necessary. So, 
Uh, if you are doing a quantitative research, uh, then you have an objective and then based on that objective, you come with hypothesis and then you test that hypothesis if you are doing a quantitative research. If you are doing a qualitative research, then you have an objective, but you don't have an hypothesis, right? So you have an objective, then you analyze your qualitative data and then you come up with your findings. So <clears throat> hypothesis normally are where you look at uh, the relationship between two variables. OK, um, so it's more quantitative in nature, so it would depend on what type of research you are conducting. Uh, to conclude, if you are a quantitative researcher, you need to have hypothesis. If you are a qualitative researcher, you don't need to have hypothesis. Thank you very much. So, and Hadwining is uh, still asking another question. So, any free SPSS software? Uh, I don't know how to answer these questions. So yeah, uh, I think you need to check with your universities. This, this, most of the universities do have subscription to SPSS, so you can get it for free. I don't think you can get it for free outside. I mean, you have to pay for it. Um, but I think most of the universities should have SPSS. Uh, at the same time, um, if uh, you are doing some simple uh, analysis, like just simple regression, simple correlation, uh, then there are some free open source softwares that are available, not SPSS, but something similar. There's one called JMP Pro, uh, which is free. Um, R has uh, several uh, packages that, uh, but you probably need to know how to do coding. Um, but there are some frees. And, and yes, and a lot of stuff that you do in SPSS can also be done in Microsoft Excel. So um, you just need to watch some videos on YouTube, um, how to do things, so that can also help you for free softwares. Okay, I put our statistics somewhere, some packages, and could you type, uh, Professor Kizan, could you type another one uh, you've, you've mentioned? Yeah, okay. just give me a minute, let me confirm the name exactly. Okay, so dear participants, if you have any other questions or comments, please leave them in the chat. And while you're thinking about them, um, let's play in our, our game. Could you just, yeah, GMP Pro, got it. Let's check it, yeah, Google everything right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, so let's play another game um, in the end of our session. Could you type the country that you are um, from, you're, you're having a session from. So for instance, if you're from Ukraine, you, you put Ukraine. If you're from UK or Turkey, it could be Ukraine, Turkey or UK. So go ahead, type your country. Um, let's see how many countries do we have today. Bangladesh, Tunisia, Ukraine, of course. From Florida, we have the United States. Ghana, Pakistan, United States, wow. Anyone from India or India is too late for now? I saw some participant from India. Turkey. It is great. Great. We have a very interesting, uh, diverse community of researchers who spent two hours today to re to uh, face the main challenges that all we have. Saudi Arabia. Wow, nice. It is it is such a happiness to have you here. And again, we have another question. Dear sir, can you repeat your response for what are the processes and procedures for scale creation? How to do phase content and construct validation? Oh, that's uh, that's uh, that's a two-hour session, <laughs> and it's so sort of like. Uh, okay, so scale development, uh, it's a very interesting thing and I think many of us should look into that because <clears throat> it has to deal with how do we measure things, right? So uh, I'm not going to go too much in detail because it's quite a lot of stuff that, that comes into scale development, but right now I'll just focus on uh, face content and construct validation. So face validation simply means that uh, when somebody looks at it, like reads the question, are they easy to understand or not? This is what face validation means. So are the questions too long? Do the scales like the measurement scales, Likert scale or whatever you are using, does that make sense? Uh, you know, is the language OK um, in terms of reading, right? So that is face uh, validity. Normally you will have to do it through experts 
or either through pilot test. Uh, so you can do pilot test, but in pilot test, you need to ask respondents to specifically focus on the face, like how does this look to them? Uh, then you have content validity. Content validity are your questions specifically. Like, are your questions really measuring what they are supposed to measure? Right. So this is that comes normally from uh, expert opinion. So you need to send it to five or ten or fifteen experts in the domain, um, and those experts can comment on whether these questions are the right questions to measure what you are supposed to measure. So that's your uh, content validity. And then the last one is construct validity. So construct validity is uh, again, you can use uh, either correlation analysis to do construct validity. Um, and and uh, normally when you do scale development, um, you don't use construct validity in scale development itself. You normally do construct validity after your scale is developed in an additional study where you have to include additional variables uh, to make sure that this construct, the scale that you just developed is separately considered by your respondents than other variables. So it's it's a whole long process. That's why I said normally it's uh, like two hour session in itself about scale development, but I hope it makes sense. Yes, thank you very much. Makes perfect sense. Thank you very much. So uh, for now, again, thank you very much, uh, Professor Faison. And thank you to participants from all around the world, India including, I see you. And still uh, around midnight, but we are having such fun today. Thank you very much, you guys. Thank you.